All rise. The court is now in session. The Honorable George Antoine presiding. Ladies and gentlemen, please be seated and please remove your hats. You are in a courtroom. I am Judge George Antoine and this court deserves your respect and your attention. I apologize for the temporary quarters. My courtroom is being cleaned today. It's been several years and it's full of dust from spider mites and prosecuting attorney speeches. <laughs> we are gathered here today to hear testimony about a case that happened in the county courthouse near this St. James Park in the year 1886. It was not a very important case having to do with taxes on some real fences. Really boring stuff. But something happened when that case reached the Supreme Court. We are going to discover just what happened and what were the consequences. We have a defendant, Justice Waite, charged with negligence of duty connected with that 1886 case. I now turn over to our prosecutor, Mr. Samuel Addison. Thank you, Your Honor. One important case we are going to review today is called Santa Clara County versus Southern Pacific Railroad decided in 1886 by the U.S. Supreme Court. Let me address the defendant, the Honorable Morrison Remick Waite, who served as the Chief Justice of the U.S. Supreme Court at that time. We had a little trouble digging up Justice Waite. In fact, we weren't sure whether he was still in one piece and fit to testify. I had to dust him off, get some whiskey down his throat. But we are lucky, as you can see, he is here with us today. How are you, Morrison? Well, my, my lumbago is acting up a little bit, and I still feel a bit wheezy. You know, my memory's not so good. Say, what year is this, anyway? And is this really San Jose, California? I don't recognize a thing. Just a minute, uh, Justice Wait. Please raise your right hand. Oh, yes, Your Honor. You swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. And yes, it is San Jose, and the year is 2012. Well, I'll be doggone. Now, Morrison, do you recall a case settled in 1886 concerning Santa Clara County and the Southern Pacific Railroad? Uh, yeah, I seem to recall that case. Uh, it had something to do with fences, but you'll have to fill in the details. Uh, that's right. Very good, sir. The railroad didn't like a particular tax levied by the county about fences alongside their line. So they sued the county. They lost. They went to Superior Court. Then the California Supreme Court. They lost again. So the railroad took it to the Supreme Court. You were the Chief Justice. Do you recall the verdict? Uh, well, no, my memory's not so good. You'll have to fill me in. The railroad won again. The tax was apparently incorrectly computed. Uh, yes, it seems to me there was some dispute between Santa Clara County and the State Board of Equalization. Well, that's very good, sir, but we're interested in something else. Do you recall, did the issue of a corporation as a person came mm -hmm. up? Mm -hmm. Oh, I must caution you about leading the witness, Mr. Adamson. 
Uh, you'll have to give me some leeway, Judge. As you can see, my friend has been out of commission for a while, so to speak. Very well, proceed. Answer the question if you can, Mr. Wade. Oh, uh, yes, uh, thank you. Let's see, corporations as persons. Yes, I seem to recall that the railroad brought up that issue during their pleadings, and they pled that the uh, corporation was entitled to be a person under the clause in the 14th Amendment. Uh, that's, uh, that was my recollection. And what did you do about that? Oh, I'm pretty sure I struck that down. Well, I'm not sure. Uh, can I see the written opinion, please? Yes, here it is. Oh, uh, yes, let's see here. Uh, let's see. Oh, it says the defendant corporations are persons within the intent of the clause in Section 1 of the 14th Amendment to the Constitution of the United States, which forbids a state to deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. What? Corporations are persons? That can't be right. We never claimed that in the opinion. Oh, but wait, this is just the head note. Head note? Could you explain that to the court, please? Well, a head note is a summary written by our court clerk. It's supposed to summarize the court's opinion, but it has no legal weight. No legal weight? No, sir. Any court is required to ignore the head note and only base the opinion in some future case on the opinion itself. So corporate personhood is not in the opinion. Well, let's see. No, I can't find it. Oh, wait, here's something. These questions regarding the constitutional amendment belong to a class which this court should not decide unless their determination is essential to the disposition of the case. In other words, the opinion brushed personhood aside. Well, yes, that appears to be what it says. We did not decide that corporations are persons. Huh. Makes sense. You know, back then, the folks were mighty suspicious of corporations. There were just too many ways for them to go bad. After all, a corporation has only one objective, and that's to make money for their shareholders. And it'll do whatever it legally can to make money. Dangerous. So where did the head note come from? That head note was written by John Bancroft Davis, my court reporter. Ah, oh, that son of a gun! I remember glancing over the printed report and deciding it was okay, but now that I've read it more carefully, that head note is just plain wrong. Of course, uh, I've always been partial to the SP Railroad. They've been mighty good to me, what with uh, all those free travel <coughs> passes and other... Sir, I must warn you not to continue with that thought. Do not further incriminate yourself. Oh, uh, excuse me, Honor. I, I don't understand. What do you mean? Accepting favors from persons or corporations that appear or may appear before your court is a criminal offense. The Constitution, Article 1, Section 9. Oh, yes, the Emolument Clause, as I recall. Well, <laughs> We didn't worry about that much back then. I mean, everyone was doing it, and it never seemed to affect our opinions. We also found a memorandum from that case in your handwriting as follows, and I quote, In opening, the court stated that it did not wish to hear the argument on the question whether the 14th Amendment applies to such corporations as our parties in these suits. All of the justices were of the opinion it does, Please let me know whether I correctly caught your words and oblige yours truly. Signed, J.C.B. Davis. Justice Waite, do you recall writing this memo? No, no. Oh, wait, yes, I do recall Davis bringing up something of that sort. But I'd forgotten about the memo. Well, may I point out to the court that this memo seems to state that all of the Supreme Court justice considered a corporation a person. Was that really the case? 
Well, well, yes, as a matter of fact, that was my impression. But of course, that was just my passing comment. It was not part of the opinion. As I recall, my complete reply to Davis went something like this. Uh, I think your memorandum in the California Railroad tax case expresses with sufficient accuracy what was said before the argument began. So you mean to say that your opinion settled no constitutional question? That's exactly what I mean. We uh, ruled in favor of the railroad, but very narrowly on the opinion of taxes, and that's all. Justice Waite, would it surprise you to know that your little head note in this case has been turned into a whole series of Supreme Court decisions in favor of corporations as person, granting all corporation personhood rights to corporations? What? That's really stupid. Have you forgotten all the pain and suffering caused by the East India Company under British rule? Why, the Boston Tea Party was a reaction to their monopolistic and destructive practices. That company ruled most of India with their own police, judges, and prison system, all with the intention of stripping as much gold out of that unfortunate nation as they could. The Indians mounted rebellion several times, but were ruthlessly shot down by that company. Don't tell me that you want to go back to that system and let some corporation run roughshod over our democracy. There is considerable evidence, sir, that that is happening right now. May I call a witness regarding that? Hey, would you please shut that thing off? Shut up, you darn thing! What kind of a contraption is this, anyway? What? What are you saying? Wait, wait! Would you please turn pizza. that thing off? Pizza? I didn't order any pizza. Pizza? <laughs> Your Honor, it's a I, pizza. I beg your forgiveness. Um, someone gave Wade a cell phone and told him everyone has one, but we forgot to tell him how to use it. Justice Wade, would you please put that away? Uh, Mr. Adamson, please proceed. Thank you. Your Honor, may I introduce a witness, Miss Sally Lunsford? Mrs. Lunford, would you please raise your right hand? Do you solemnly swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Yes, Your Honor. Please be seated. Now, Mrs. Lunsford, you're the daughter of a uh, miner, a Mr. Stewart, who was working at the Upper Branch Mine in West Virginia in April of 2010. Is that correct? Yes, sir. And your father was involved in a mining accident that occurred on April 5th of that year? Yes, sir. Could you please tell the court about the accident and your father? Thank you. That was a terrible day for my dad and about 29 other miners who lost their lives. Dad managed to survive it through some miracle. He'd been a coal miner since before my birth and coal runs in our veins as surely as it runs deep in the veins of our beautiful mountains. And our family depends entirely on coal. It stoked our stoves, kept the lights on, bought food for our bellies, and clothes for our backs. It's not just a livelihood, but a way of life for us. Mining is a dangerous job under the best of conditions. In bad conditions, with poor ventilation, the coal dust is so thick you can't see your hand in front of your face. In any case, my dad and his fellow miners put on their work clothes, boots, and lighted caps and carried their lunch buckets into the mine to provide for their families, come what may. My dad evaded death more than once in the 34 years of his career, and I give God glory for that. He was nearly run over by a cart once, and another time a, a piece of machinery pinned him to the mine wall. Pinned him to the wall. Uh, Miss Lunsford, can you please tell us about the mine accident now? 
On April 5th, I was living in Newport News, Virginia, when I got a phone call from my mother. She said there was an explosion in Dad's mind, and she didn't know whether he was in there or not. My blood axed over, and I gasped. And then I began to weep. And my brother said, with just a hint of a tremble, no, don't go jump into conclusions. We don't know anything for sure yet. And still I cried. And later, when I heard that he was okay, well, I just lost it. <laughs> Through violently stitching breath, I sobbed. I don't know why my body is doing this. Those minutes that I didn't know whether my old man was dead or alive were the worst of my life. Mrs. Lunsford, I know this is very difficult you. for you, and we appreciate you coming in. Could you please share with us about the day of the accident? Well, I'll try. I don't think the mine was safe at all. An investigation a year after the accident revealed that the ventilation system didn't adequately ventilate the mine. And as a result, explosive gases were allowed to build up. And also, the mine owner, Massey Energy, threatened miners with termination if they stopped work in areas that lacked adequate oxygen levels. Massey also failed to comply with numerous state and federal safety standards. Dad confirmed this after the, he left the company. He said that the accident was the last straw, the straw that broke the camel's back for him. He left the mine and never looked back. <laughs> Massey Energy was fined $380,000 for the safety violations. Thank you for your testimony, Ms. Lunsford. You may step down. Now, Mr. Waite, do you have anything to say? Well, I'm really saddened by that accident and the loss of all those lives, but I'm also disturbed that Massey didn't seem to care about safety. Now, she mentioned that there were state and federal safety standards, so why didn't Massey observe them? Mr. Waite, you just asked the $64 question. Oh, I don't understand. Does any of that have to do with me? Let's go back to that 1886 decision. That and a long history of Supreme Court decisions have pretty firmly established that a corporation is a person with respect to the law and the Constitution. What's more, anyone employed by that corporation, its directors, its stockholders, are all sheltered from most laws by that corporate shield. For example, the CEO of Massey Energy, Donald Blankenship, received some criticism for the conditions that led to the mine explosion, but he was never charged with a crime or even fined. He retired from Massey shortly after the accident after receiving several multi-million dollar compensation packages. Well, that's, that's incredible. I can hardly believe my ears. Somebody should have gone to prison or been hanged for that kind of willful negligence. That's the corporate shield at work, sir. Well, now, there must have been mine inspectors. How did Massey keep the mine inspectors from shutting down the mines? Ah, there we have another side of corporate personhood thing. Massey insisted on its personhood rights under the Fourth Amendment of the Constitution. That ensures the right of people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects, and so forth. The Massey lawyers claimed that they, that meant that the company had the right to refuse to be inspected, or at least to be informed in advance of an inspection. That sounds absurd, but the general idea was actually upheld in a Supreme Court several years ago in Marshall v. Barlow's 1978. The owner of Barlow's demanded that a search warrant be produced before an OSHA inspection and won on Fourth Amendment grounds. Mr. Adamson, I'd like a copy of your findings related to Massey accident and Marshall v. Barlow's, if you please. Of course, Your Honor. 
So Massey Cole did permit inspections, but only on the condition that the inspectors first obtained a warrant from a court. Well, I can see where this is going. Perhaps Massey found a way to be informed when the warrant was issued. Heck, in my time, all that would take would be a bottle of good scotch or a box of cigars for the judge. My pardon to the judge. If there was a lot of dust in the mine, well then Massey had some time to flush it out before the inspectors showed up. Exactly right, and that's pretty much how it worked. You'll recall that Mrs. Sally Lunsford testified that the miners were asked to keep their mouths shut about the real conditions of the mine, or they'd lose their job. So these inspections were usually tickety-boo, as the English might say. Uh, what happened to the company after the accident? Not much. They were fined about a half a million dollars, as Mrs. Lunsford explained, but that was it. it. may sound like a lot of money. It's less than a month's profit from that mine. I personally petitioned the Attorney General of Delaware to revoke Massey Energy's corporate charter, something that the Delaware law claims should be done in a case like that. After all, Massey was guilty of a court and a law of crime that led to the deaths of 29 miners. But they didn't revoke Massey's charter. Instead, Massey was later bought out by another company, Alpha Natural Resources, also a Delaware corporation. And that ended the possibility of charter revocation. The top management was replaced, but otherwise those mines were just started up again as though nothing had happened. So what do you conclude from that, sir? Oh, I feel pretty guilty about that 1886 case now. At the time, that wrong head note didn't seem important at all. Well, I was pretty busy at the time, and I just got weighed down with a lot of other cases. Then I died a few years later. Also, the, that opinion was all printed up nice and distributed before I had a chance to look it over. It just didn't seem worth the trouble to issue a corrected opinion with a more accurate head note. Now, surely my mistake can't have been that important. Why, well, that was over 150 years ago. Actually, it's gotten worse. Our current Supreme Court recently decided a case called Citizens United versus the FEC. It finds that corporations must be treated as persons and entitled to virtually all First Amendment rights of free speech. They can now spend unlimited money on campaign advertising. Unlimited campaign money? Why would that make any difference? This may shock you, but our American public gets most of its news through something called television news. And the television broadcasting stations are also corporations with money-making as their only real goal. Political candidates have to pay for ads on television to reach the public. It's very expensive, and they all desperately need to raise money for that, or they won't get elected. How would, why would anyone want to stand for that? Doesn't anybody read the Congressional Record or a good newspaper anymore? Hardly anyone. Most voters depend on the television, and much of the television news is just really distorted in favor of their corporate sponsors. Oh, I'm tired. After all, I've been around for almost 200 years. Uh, may I step down? Uh, yes, uh, thank you. You may step down. Thank you for helping us understand the situation. Well, just a, just a minute here. I don't know that I can let Justice Wade off the hook so easily. Justice Wade, I find you guilty of carelessness in dealing with that 1886 Santa Clara case. You should have never let that misleading head note find its way into print. What do you have to say for yourself before I pass sentence? Well, Your, your Honor, I uh, appreciate your concern. And yes, I plead guilty of carelessness. However, I have to blame that confounded Bancroft Davis for this. I had known that Davis was really partial to the railroads and the corporate interests. Maybe he was even getting money from them, I don't know. He certainly enjoyed plenty of free trips with his wife and kids. 
Oh, and by the way, my associate on the bench, Justice Stephen Field, is equally culpable. Never liked him, but I had no idea how things turned out after I was laid to rest. Well, Field's background includes such incidents as confrontations with lynch mobs, and courtroom scenes with drawn pistols, and elections bought with cigars and cognac. Such was his early career in Marysville, California during the gold rush. Well, in spite of his disreputable history, he was elected to the California State Legislature and his political career really advanced rapidly. He also became a close friend of the organizers of the Central Pacific Railroad. That was Colas Huntington, Mark Hopkins, Leland Stanford, and Charles Crocker. And every one of those four was up to his neck in corruption regarding the Central Pacific Railroad. But none of them ever served a day in jail. Stanford even made Field a trustee of his university. There must have been several others on the Supreme Court equally guilty. But you, know, you are right. You know, Davis was my clerk, and I was ultimately responsible for that head note. Mrs. Lumford, I'm sorry about those miners and, and your father and all those 29 that lost their lives to this kind of legal issue. So, Your Honor, I, I must plead guilty, and I throw myself on the mercy of the court. I sentenced you to 10 days in the county law library to trace through all the corporate personhood legal troubles that has been launched since that 1886 case. It is quite a story, and one that most people aren't even aware of. Well, Your Honor, uh, thank you very much. I expect I had expected to catch up on affairs anyway. You know, that is, until I'm re to return to my maker. As to corporate personhood, I'd like to see that good and buried along with your mortal remains. Mrs. Longford, may I express my sympathy for your grief? Although your father survived the accident, I'm aware that he and you have lost many friends. And I feel I must urge our Supreme Court, headed by Chief Justice John Roberts, to reverse that Citizen United decision, a corporation must not be granted full citizenship rights as a person under our Constitution. Court is no longer in session.